Hello, very warm welcome to Middle East Matters. I'm Sanam Shantier. Coming up on this week's programme, the singer of Syria's revolution is Silence. Abdul Basset al Sarut, a football star turned rebel, dies fighting the forces of Bashar al Assad. Syrians are divided over his legacy. Qatar's foreign ministry spokeswoman tells me the pattern of reckless behavior in the region needs to stop. Stay tuned for my interview with Lulwa Rashid Al Khatar. Also coming up on this week's program, another episode of animation series Flavors of Iraq. This time, our protagonist takes us back to 2011, when the last convoy of US soldiers pulled out of Iraq. Thank you for watching Middle East Matters. We start with the Syrian quagmire, a conflict that has ravaged the country for eight years. The latest news that has polarized Syrians is the death of a former footballer who abandoned the pitch for the fight against the regime of Bashar al-Assad. Abdul Basset al sarut died of wounds sustained while fighting, and his legacy leaves Syrians divided. Nobody in Syria is immune to the ravages of the civil war. Not even a well-known football player and subject of an award-winning documentary. The burial of Abdel Basset al sarut is just the latest reminder of that reality. The promising goalkeeper turned rebel fighter succumbed to battle wounds on June 8th, following clashes with government forces in northwest Syria. His symbolism extended from the people who loved him, which is reflected today with the number of people who showed up for his funeral, both here and in Turkey. There are people who even cried, and I'm sure some of them never even met Sarut. They cried because they know that he's one of the revolution's symbols. Sarut's notoriety as a symbol of the rebellion dates back to his participation in the uprising in the central city of Homs in 2011. He later survived the brutal siege of the city, though several of his family members, including his father and four brothers, were killed there. Known for leading popular protest songs, his transformation from a protest leader to a full-on military commander was documented in the film Return to Homs, which won a prize at the Sundance Film Festival in 2014. But later that year, rumors that he joined the Islamic State group began to circulate. Though he denied the claims, he admitted he considered the idea when the terrorist organization appeared to be the only group strong enough to topple Bashar al-Assad. Sarut's involvement with different rebel groups resembles that of thousands of Syrians. Their trajectories reflect the complexity and gradual fragmentation of the uprising against the Syrian regime. The dynamics that lead a Syrian or an Iraqi to join a jihadist group are not at all the same as the dynamics that lead Western jihadists to go fight in Syria or Iraq. The dynamics are local, the causes are local, and their radicalization is not at all definitive. Many Syrians fought with the Free Syrian Army, then the Islamic State group, before going back to the Free Syrian Army, or even the Syrian Democratic Forces. Now, more than eight years on, there is little hope for regime change. Bashar al-Assad has retained his grip on power through brutal assaults on opposition-held provinces. Before he died, Sarut had been fighting in Hama, among the last of such strongholds. Now it's time for our guest of the week on Middle East Matters. Earlier I went to the Qatari embassy here in the French capital to speak to the country's foreign ministry spokeswoman, Lulwa Rashid al Khater, about a host of regional issues. Your Excellency, Lulwa Rashid al Khater, thank you so much for speaking to us here on Middle East Matters. Thank you so much for having me. I'd like to start with the rising tensions in the region. We've heard from your foreign minister, Sheikh Mohammed, saying that Talks are being had with both sides, Tehran and Washington, to de-escalate and possibly even mediate. Yeah, I mean, uh, to be very precise about what uh, His Excellency the Foreign Minister said, um, he said that we're working with other countries in the region, uh, also with Japan, to de-escalate. And, of course, potentially, we're more than happy to play the uh, mediating role uh, if we're asked to do so. Now, the Trump administration is seemingly open to talks. According to the conversations that uh, you've had with the Iranians, are there any indications that they, too, will be willing to take to the negotiation table? We believe that the Iranians are open to discuss and, and, and negotiate. 
Um, of course, we realize that every party would have their own conditions. Uh, there are certain uh, concessions that need to be made from uh, both parties. And it's also our um, collective responsibility in the region uh, to play a role in that. At the end of the day, let's remember that we are in the region. It's not only between Iran and the U.S., it's all of us together. And of course, even though Qatar is opposed to military confrontation, you will be at the heart of it because Qatar hosts the U.S.'s biggest military base in the Middle East. The fact that um, the uh, region cannot take any more um, um, escalations, definitely not a military one, um, is something that everyone needs to uh, pay very close attention to. Let me give you just one scenario, closing the Strait of Hormuz. Now, the consequences of that will not be only on Qatar, it will be on the entire uh, world. Your Excellency, I'd like to move on to another source of tension in the region. That's, of course, the two-year standoff now between Qatar and the Saudi-led coalition, this ongoing embargo. Uh, now officials in Doha are saying that it's possible that this is now spilling into other countries, namely Sudan. Well, we've seen the spillover of that from the very beginning. So June 5th, 2017, a blockade by Saudi, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Egypt was imposed on Qatar. Our own citizens were expelled from these countries, uh, students, uh, people in hospitals. So from that time, we've seen that many situations. The situation with the Prime Minister Hariri, to give you an example. The situation in Yemen. And of course, I mean, in Libya before even Sudan, and of course now in Sudan. So once again, we think that there is a pattern of reckless uh, behavior in our region that needs to stop and needs to be revisited. Any chance that the Qataris and the Saudis will come to some sort of an agreement in the foreseeable future? Well, the Kuwaitis are mediating. We're, uh, we very, very much appreciate that position. Uh, it's not only between Qatar and, and, and Saudi, it's also the other countries as well, namely United Arab Emirates, Bahrain and, and Egypt. Uh, so we have welcomed the, the uh, mediation. However, we've not seen any positive response from the uh, neighboring locating countries. Lastly, and very briefly, I'd like to speak to you about the 2022 World Cup, of course, being hosted by Qatar. FIFA has finally come out to admit a violation of worker standards. Your Excellency, we're talking about a high number of deaths among migrant workers. What steps is Qatar taking to prevent an escalation of this? We're very serious uh, about uh, preserving the rights of the guest workers in Qatar. We very much appreciate all the efforts they've made uh, with us to develop our country. Why would you say it's taken so long for Qatar to try and implement it's, these? No, actually, it's not exactly that. We have already implemented many things. We are ahead of our region when it comes to that. To give you an example, we have abolished the exit uh, permit. Uh, what's known as the kafala system has been abolished. Minimum wages have been applied. We have now... But I think this, this is the focus on the number of deaths among the migrant workers um, that, that's been brought to I, our attention. No, I haven't seen any exact uh, numbers uh, that, uh, An estimate that I had yeah. from the International Trade Union uh, Confederation was some 4,000 before the Games even start. Uh, I'm not sure about the accuracy of that, to be honest, but my understanding of the situation is that the average of, of that in Qatar is lower than the global average. As a matter of fact, and as a like uh, uh, fruit of, of those um, efforts, the um, um, ILO has closed uh, the issue against Qatar in November 2017, and we have signed uh, an agreement with them, a three-year agreement in accordance to that. Uh, Qatar will become a model uh, in the region uh, when it comes to the rights of the uh, migrant workers. So we are very much committed to that. On that note, Lulwa Rashid al Khater, the spokesperson for the Foreign Ministry of Qatar, thank you so much for being with us uh, here on Middle East Matters. Thank you so much, very glad. We'll end this week's show with another episode of our animation series, Flavors of Iraq. Today, I can report that, as promised, the rest of our troops in Iraq will come home by the end of the year. After nearly nine years, the America's war in Iraq will be over. In 2011, just before the American soldiers left, I was given permission to film them one last time. 
I spent a week in the green zone. I waited for the troops to be sent on a mission, then I accompanied them. I had time to get to know them. Most were younger than me. At the start of the war, they'd walk on foot in the streets of Baghdad and chat to people. But after 5,000 of them died in the conflict, the soldiers stopped talking to Iraqis. They would only leave the green zone by helicopter or in armored vehicles. One night, I dared to say these words for the first time. I am Iraqi. I was scared they would turn against me, but they were curious. They asked lots of questions. What is life like in Baghdad? What's the difference between Sunnis and Shias? Or between Arabs and Kurds? After eight years in Iraq, they still knew nothing. That night, I had the chance to look them in the eyes and tell them what I thought. I told them that freedom can't be forced on people, that they had empowered 1,000 dictators by trying to shoot one, that they had destroyed a country on the basis of a lie, in the world. that they had started a war between armed groups supported by foreign powers that they had done more bad than good. And today, the country was in pieces. We had nothing to do here. Yes, they had nothing to do here. The Iraq that I dreamed of as a child, the Iraq that my father fled, but loved so much. The Iraq split by the Euphrates River, which I take my name from. That Iraq no longer existed. Well, that's it from Middle East Matters. Thank you for watching.